Chapter Sixteen of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Sixteen: The Amateur Detectives. One. By nine o'clock, the last pantechnicon that was going back that night had rumbled off to Lowestoft, there to be entrained for London. One still remained on the drive, waiting to be taken back by the horses that would bring the first van in the morning. With the last van went Bindle, much to his regret. "'It's like not going to your own funeral,' he grumbled. Homely was shut up and in darkness, save for a slit of light that could be seen beneath the Venetian blind of the dining-room. Inside the room sat the foreman. He was smoking a meditative pipe, and cursing the luck that left him at Homely to play night watchman. He was not a nervous man, but his mind instinctively travelled back to the events of the day. Why had so many people been desirous of seeing Bindle? He had subjected Bindle himself to a very thorough and picturesque cross-examination. He had told him what he thought of him, and of those responsible for his being. He had coaxed him and threatened him, but without result. Bindle had expressed the utmost astonishment at his sudden popularity, and professed himself utterly unable to account for it. Once or twice the foreman thought he saw the shadow of a grin flit across Bindle's face, especially when Bindle suggested that he should act as night watchman, adding as an excuse the obvious fatigue of his superior. It was this that had terminated the interview with great suddenness. Thus meditating upon the curious occurrences of the day, the foreman dropped off to sleep, for he was tired, and the armchair in which he half lay, half sat, was extremely comfortable. As he slept, a dark form moved stealthily up the drive towards the house. Keeping well within the shadow of the trees, it paused to listen, then moved on for a dozen yards and stopped again. When it reached the top of the drive, it crept off to the left in the direction of the tradesman's entrance. Displaying great caution, the figure finally reached the scullery window, which by a curious chance was unfastened. After great deliberation and much listening, it opened the window, and, inserting itself feet foremost, disappeared. Three minutes later, the back door was noiselessly unbolted and opened. The figure looked out cautiously, then retreated within, leaving the door open to its fullest extent. The first figure had scarcely disappeared before another approached the back door from the opposite direction. It must have come through the hedge and crept along in its shadow from the main entrance. The second figure paused, as if astonished at finding the back door open. For some minutes it stood in the shadow of the water-butt, listening. Finally, with a quiet, insidious motion, it slid through the doorway. The first figure, passing cautiously through the servants' quarters, had reached the hall. Finding all the doors shut, it proceeded stealthily upstairs to the large drawing-room that overlooked the drive. The door was open! Groping its way with great care, the figure for one second allowed the light of a dark lantern to show. The effect was startling. The whole room was piled up with long, narrow wooden cases. On several tables, formed by boards on trestles, were laid out what appeared to be dozens of rifles. The figure gasped. The place was apparently nothing less than a huge arsenal. The long, narrow cases contained guns, guns, guns! The figure had just picked up one of the guns to make sure that its eyes were telling the truth when there was the sound of a footfall on the landing. The figure turned quickly, and the rifle dropped with a crash to the floor. For some time it stood as if petrified with horror, then with a swift, stealthy movement reached the door. Here it turned sharply to the left and ran into something small and soft. With a yell the something turned. In a moment two forms were locked together. With a thud they fell, and lay a writhing, wriggling mass at the top of the stairs. 2. The foreman had no idea how long he had slept, or what it was that awakened him, but suddenly he found himself wide awake with a feeling that something was happening. The lamp had gone out, there was no moon, and he felt cold, although he knew it to be July. For a minute he listened intently. Not a sound broke the stillness, save the rustle of the trees as the wind sighed through them. He went to the window and looked out under the blind. It was quite dark. He shook himself, then pinched his leg. Yes, he was awake. 
then he heard a creak overhead and it suddenly came home to him that the house was being burgled a passionate anger seemed to grip hold of him silently and swiftly he opened the door that led into the hall he had not moved three steps before he was brought to a standstill by a yell that echoed through the whole place it was followed a moment later by what appeared to be an avalanche descending the stairs from stair to stair it bumped through the darkness and finally lay heaving and grunting almost at his feet there were muttered exclamations curses threats and the dull sound of blows the foreman sprang forward and clutched with his right hand a human ear feeling about with his left hand he secured a handful of hair then he brought two heads together with a crack the muttering and movement ceased and the foreman pantechnicon man struck a match crikey the exclamation burst involuntarily from his lips he rummaged in his pockets and presently produced about two inches of candle this he lighted and held over the recumbent mass at his feet well i'm blowed he stuttered conscious of the inadequacy of his words there at his feet lay mr greenhales and sergeant rannock whom the foreman recognized only as two of the afternoon's visitors for fully two minutes he stood regarding his captives then with a grin of delight he blew out the candle carefully opening the front door there was nothing to be seen save the trees and the empty pantechnicon van the great black shape appeared to give him an idea the doors were open and without hesitation he stepped back into the hall picked up one of the prostrate figures and carried it into the van a moment later he did the same with the other closing the doors he barred and padlocked them and re-entered the hall later he returned to the pantechnicon unfastened the padlock and left the doors merely barred still grinning to himself he once more entered the house picking up an old-fashioned pistol from many that lay upon the dining-room table next he opened the dining-room windows at the bottom performing the same operation with those in the morning-room finally locking the doors of both rooms from the outside he made a tour of the whole house and having satisfied himself that no one was secreted within he slipped out of the front door and closed it behind him unaware that a pair of terrified eyes were watching him from the head of the stairs there's still two to come he muttered and waited at the end of an hour he heard a grind as of gravel beneath a boot he listened eagerly after fully five minutes of silence he heard another grind and a dark shape approached the dining-room window the foreman still waited it took a quarter of an hour for the shape to make up its mind to raise the window higher and enter the sound of suppressed wheezing could be distinctly heard when the figure had with difficulty forced itself upon the window sill the foreman leaped out grasped its leg and pulled there was a wheezy shout and the foreman was kneeling on the path with a figure between his knees and the gravel again he struck a match which disclosed the ashen features of the landlord of the dove and easel without hesitation the foreman picked him up and bundled him into the pantechnicon and once more barred the door as he turned back he saw the hall door open slightly at first he thought it was his imagination as he watched however the door continued to open stealthily inch by inch until finally a figure appeared dawn was breaking and in the half-light he saw a small man slide out and creep along by the side of the house at first the foreman watched then seeing that his man was likely to escape he sprang out the figure ran the foreman ran and ran the faster then the figure stopped and facing round caught the foreman a blow in the chest as he came on unable to stop with a yell of rage the foreman lifted his pistol and brought it down with a crash upon his opponent's head in a gray heap the trespasser dropped another match was struck revealing sir charles custance's rubicund features down which a slow trickle of blood wound its way that's the old bloomin bag i take it commented the victor grimly as he bundled the portly frame of the magistrate into the van taking every precaution against a possible rush for freedom on the part of the other captives he then addressed the interior at large i'm a watchin outside and if you're so much as cough or blow your noses i'll shoot through the sides with this ere old blunderbuss d'ye ear cockies 
with that he banged the doors to barred and padlocked them and sat on the tailboard watching the grayness of the dawn steal through the trees as he struggled to keep awake he was so occupied when at half past seven a distant rumble announced the arrival of the expected pantechnicon from lowestoft as it slowly lumbered up the drive the foreman grinned and he grinned more broadly when he saw bindle slip from the tailboard followed by ginger and two other men morning bindle morning ginger he called out politely slep well bindle grinned and ginger grumbled something inaudible now one of you two go and get my breakfast and the other telephone for the police the men stared at him ginger he continued complacently you'll find two eggs and some bacon in the all and a stove in the kitchen and a pot of coffee what only wants warming up i'm hungry ginger as hungry as hell is for you ginger bindle give my compliments to the police at lowestoft and arst them to send a few peelers over ere at once to take charge of what i caught last night bindle scratched his head uncertain whether or no it was all a joke yes bindle continued the foreman i've got them all all in black maria and he jerked his thumb in the direction of the pantechnicon all your very dear old pals cocky like to see em bindle still looked puzzled but when the foreman had explained his grin transcended in its breadth and good humour that of his superior then the foreman changed the style of his idiom and his subordinates went their ways as he had intended and directed that they should the foreman was just finishing his breakfast by sopping up the bacon fat with a piece of bread when there reached him the sound of a motor car chunking its way along in the distance the news of the night's doings had spread rapidly and a small crowd was collected round the gates of homely bindle grinned through the bars and occasionally threw to the curious neighbors bits of information the car approached and drew up it was a tall spare man of about thirty-eight or forty with thin angular features he seemed surprised to see the crowd but turning the car through the open gates drove slowly up to the house the crowd recognized the stranger as mr richard miller the new tenant of homely he nodded to the foreman who immediately descended from the tailboard and approached good morning sir he said you're earlier than what i had hoped sir but that's on the lucky side i've been having a rather lively night sir at this moment there was a loud and continuous pounding from within the pantechnicon that he had just left if you're not quiet i'll shoot god forgive me but i will he shouted over his shoulder then turning to mr miller he winked jocosely getting a little impatient sir they heard you come i s'pose i've had em there for several hours now ah here's the police as he spoke another car appeared round the bend of the curve and an inspector in uniform and three plain-clothes men got out now there's going to be some fun the foreman chuckled to himself as addressing mr miller he told of the happenings of the night before when he had finished the features of bindle who had been relieved by ginger were suffused with a grin so broad and good-humoured that it contrasted strangely with the astonishment written on the faces of the others that's the story gentlemen and there's my bag jerking his thumb in the direction of the pantechnicon four of em there are i counted em carefully and every one a charles piece you'd better be careful as you let em out he added i hadn't time to search em they came so quick like flies in summer the inspector breathed hard mr miller looked grave and concerned the plain clothesman looked blank bindle looked cheerful whilst the foreman looked as a man looks only once in a lifetime deliberately he approached the tail of the van undid the lock removed the bar threw open the doors and stood quietly aside for fully half a minute nothing happened then the portly form of sergeant rannick emerged rannick gasped the inspector from lowestoft the sergeant forgot to salute his superior officer he was humiliated his collar was torn one eye was blackened and his nose was swollen closely following him came sir charles custance and mr greenhales who between them supported the inert form of mr gandy wheezing pitifully all were much battered sir charles's face was covered with blood mr greenhales had lost his wig and his false teeth 
whilst mr gandy had lost the power to move what in heaven's name is the meaning of this asked the inspector it means thundered sir charles who was the first to find his voice that we have been brutally and murderously assaulted by a band of ruffians that's me and me only commented the foreman complacently i'm the band cocky and don't you forget it it means said sergeant rannick that having information that this house was packed with firearms i came to make investigation and got caught cocky interrupted the foreman hold your tongue shouted mr greenhales in a hollow toothless voice dancing with fury hold your tongue you shall suffer for this at last from the incoherent shoutings and reproaches in which the words germans spies herr Müller were bandied back and forth mr miller and the inspector pieced together the story of how four patriots had been overcome by one foreman pantechnicon man the inspector turned to mr miller as a matter of form sir and in the execution of my duty i should be glad to know if it is true that your house is full of arms and ammunition he asked politely of arms certainly inspector most certainly mr miller replied i am supposed to have the finest collection of firearms in the country come and see them or such as are unpacked and the inspector looked at sergeant rannock and the plain-clothes constables looked away from him and sir charles and mr greenhales looked irefully around for bindle but bindle was nowhere to be seen funny none of em seemed to see the joke he remarked to a clump of rhododendrons halfway down the drive End of chapter 16 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com